I'm going to give a little background on Anne, uh, and then there is a full dinner. I wanted to let everyone know. If you didn't think there was dinner, there is dinner. What you had before was snacks, so uh, it's going to be a great dinner. Um, and listening to the wine glasses fall, Adiba, next year, not so much wine before dinner, okay? Not working out well. Uh, so Anne, Anne's parents were going to be here uh, to introduce her, and, and, and they couldn't make it uh, uh, at the last minute. But... Um, but the important thing, I think, about the way Anne grew up, and I'm going to give some background for those of you who don't know, is she grew up kind of on the Stanford campus. Her father was a physics professor at Stanford, and her mother, Esther, uh, at Pelly High. Her mother um, is not only an extraordinary teacher, but one of the most honored teachers, not just in this area, but in the country, and deservedly so. And I wanted to take a moment with that, because you grew up in a teaching family, to recognize that pretty much everyone here has said, Oh, by the way, i got to thank my teachers, either at a university or at high school or before that, because none of us, no one, probably no one in this room, but certainly no one on this stage could be where they are without looking back and recognizing there was some instructor somewhere, some teacher who decided to not make the most amazing living, but instead really honor the next generation. Because you certainly don't go into teaching, and certainly not at a public high school, um, to have a stock option payout, do you? You don't. Your payout is watching every year those kids graduate and later on coming back and sitting here and watching one of your students on stage. So a little bit of a round of applause to all of our teachers if I could, because I really do feel like we don't honor them enough. Um, I'm going to come back to this a little bit. So you, you went to Gunn High School, and there's a little bit of a story that's going to come around, and was editor for the school newspaper, attended Yale, where she was a competitive ice skater and played on the varsity ice hockey team, which gives you your competitiveness, uh, which turns out to be very useful right about now uh, and over the last few years. Um, she did molecular bio biology research at uh, NIH and, uh, and uh, UC San Diego, and then became a healthcare investment analyst. Turns out, not your calling. <laughs> Left in 2006 to do what she had a passion of, which we could only, couldn't even dream of in 2006, which was to co-found 23andMe. Now, two years later, what she did was called the Invention of the Year by Time Magazine. That's an unbelievable honor. And then in October 2013, Fast Company named and the most daring CEO in America. Now, a little bit of her formal bio says, by encouraging individuals to access and learn about their own genetic information, 23andMe creates a common standardized resource that has the potential to accelerate drug discovery and bring personalized medicine to the public. I read that because it's just so well written in one sentence. Plus, getting access to your own genetic information and understanding it has always been one of Anne's ambitions. Now, a couple of big points just this week. Anne and her company hit one million customers on their platform. <laughs> Anne told me today she's like number 76. She thinks she was actually number one, but something with the algorithm isn't quite right. She's working on that, but, um, but hit one million. <clears throat> but now I'm going to walk off script a little bit because a couple of years ago, the FDA came calling. And I'm going to be very careful what I say because I recognize we're on video. <laughs> but... <clears throat> Some of you know uh, my wife, Erica, she's in the med tech uh, world. And, and so uh, breakfast conversation for us, frankly, and much of the Valley for quite a bit of time was, oh my God, what's gonna happen to 23andMe? I mean, this is, we need this, what's, oh my God. And my wife, having, ha having dealt and worked with the FDA for long periods of time, uh, um, studied me quickly on what the FDA really means. Uh, which I didn't understand from a tech perspective. I now understand because we don't really have that kind of thing in tech. Um, I mean, we have VCs, but not the FDA, right? <laughs> I'm kidding, Bill. It's okay. So, so, um, so really, it was breakfast conversation. Every morning, it had to be for months. And I'm thinking, is Anne going to move to like to the Cayman Islands? They'll run it from the Cayman Islands. They'll, do, you know, because this is the thing that you wake up and all these ideas are going through your mind. And eventually, she came around and said, okay. There, there, there is this agency, it's there for a purpose, it's there for a reason. Um, I didn't think we'd have to go through this process, but, but she is going now through the process for every single instance of what they find of, say, a genetic reference of some sort, 
Every single instance has to be sort of vetted with the FDA. I won't go through in more detail than that, but every single one. So of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of possible diseases or possible indications you might have based on the latest research, each one, one by one, has to be vetted with the FDA before you can know about it. And um, you, you can have your own feelings about that, but though, that's the law, those are the rules. And the thing, I was really, frankly, worried about you. <laughs> I mean, I go, oh my God, the poor kid. Um, um, you know, because the, the, this leads to insanity, right? But instead, I, we ran into each other a few months ago at an event, and, and, and I asked her about it. And, you know, this is what she said. I'm paraphrasing roughly. It says, this may take, Anne says this, this may take my entire life to see this through, but I will, if you remember that. And she, it, it, it truly, uh, that really struck me. It's like, yep, it's now going to take my entire life. It's not just going to be another year. It's going to be a long time, but we're going to make it through because this is too important for us to know our own human condition. It's my body, I think I wanna know about it. And there's a process to get through, and I'm just gonna go through the process. And you got your first approval just a few months ago. There's more in the works, you're working through it. It's a hard thing to do. Um, the reason I, I brought up gun at the beginning is by total coincidence, two weeks ago, I was the commencement speaker at Gun High School. And uh, I, God knows why they chose me. Um, they thought I'd be a comedian or something. I don't know what they got out of it. I did end up singing a song because uh, I wanted to be memorable. It was clearly memorable. And, um, but my message to them was interesting <clears throat> because at Gunn, as you know, Gunn has, uh, has, has uh, Gunn and Pelly High, um, there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of peer pressure to do well. And there are kids who get A, 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 and then they get a B on a test, and then they decide that it, life isn't worth living after that. Uh, it, is, it, it is the pressure that the kids told me about. It was unbelievable. I, I just had no idea. I thought it was just the parents putting out, but it's collectively. And so I gave them this message that I think is apropos for tonight. I said, it doesn't matter what school you go to, and it doesn't matter what grade you get. And it, you, guys, just get it out of your head. Here's what matters. Choose a field that makes you inspired and makes you happy because you will not inspire others unless you're inspired yourself. And you're not going to make any of your employees happy, your family happy, or anyone else happy if you're not happy yourself. So number one goal, bring yourself happiness. And since you're going to spend you know, a third or half of your waking hours in the work field, that better bring you happiness, better be part of your passion, and better be part of what inspires you. And that's what you have to do. And that's what I told those kids. And I hope one or two of them remembered it, because they're graduating. It's high school, but I'm hopeful. What I love about Anne and what I love, and I love so many things, is that, Anne, you've chosen your passion. I mean, you stopped doing what you were doing. You said, this is my passion, and this is what I'm going to do, and it doesn't matter what stands in the way. We're going to find a way through it. We're going to get through it, and it's that passion. It's because you've chosen your passion, and that's why you are going to change the world for the better for us. One of my favorite quotes from Anne, but actually of all time, is one from a couple of years ago that was published in one of the magazines. And it was only six words, and that's kind of why I like it. We all know quotes that are 60 words, and I can't remember them, but these six I can remember. And I'll end with this. She says, I think life is pretty awesome. I think life is pretty awesome. And I think life is even more awesome because you're in ours. Thank you so much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Anne. That was quite an introduction, um, and I feel honored to be introduced by you. Um, I, I do feel very lucky that I actually have found a passion, and um, one of my mentors was actually someone named David Green, who was a social entrepreneur, and, um, and it was really fun. We were at a VC event, and um, he created sort of low-cost medical devices for um, developing worlds, and one of the VCs raised his hand and asked him and said, well, what's your exit strategy? And he was so confused. He's like, my exit strategy? Well, death. Like, when, <laughs> when, when I die, I'll stop doing what I'm doing. But until then, I do what I love. And, um, <laughs> and, and I actually think that's a great motto for, for, especially for this next generation that is coming. And you talk about gun and you reference some of the suicides and what's going on is that I am really lucky that I wake up every day and I absolutely love what I do. And um, there's only one year of my life where um, 
I actually really regret, and that was the um, it, one of uh, in 1999 to 2000 when I was working on Wall Street. I worked on Wall Street for 10 years, and 99 2000. For those of you who remember the bubble, the bubble was pretty miserable, um, and and I worked like a dog. And I remember the day that my bonus was wired into my account, and I was on the bathroom floor, and I got the wire, and I started crying. And, and I quit that moment. I called my boss, I said, I'm not coming in, I, I will never do this again. And, um, and it was the one thing that I realized that doing things just for money is a horrible way to live. And I think the one of the best things, when you talk about teachers and things that my parents taught me, and growing up on Stanford campus and growing up with academics, the thing that I've really learned is I know how to live without money. And I know how to live incredibly cheaply. And my first year in New York, I made $40,000, and I thought I would never have so much money again. So I was determined that I would save $1,000 a month. Um, and I would walk every day, uh, I would walk 100 blocks every day instead of taking the subway, and I had $15 a week for food. And being able to live and know how to live without needing things is what sets you free. And so I have been lucky to be able to follow my passions. One, I obviously have a better financial situation today. I, I can actually afford the subway. Um, <laughs> um, but, but being able to know that I don't need something has set me free. And it's enabled me with 23andMe to actually do the things that I want to do. So I accepted this award in large part because when we met, actually at, when Kevin and I met at, at the TED conference, and he was telling me his passion and his story for 23andMe. And the reason why I wake up every day and I do what I do is because the impact that 23andMe has on people's lives. And the thing that I took away from Wall Street that upset me so much, I loved the research and knowing about biotech and what's going on, but knowing how we make money off people's sickness really upset me. And I would meet with companies. I met with one company once where they were saying, like, oh, you know, there was a hospital company and their revenues were going up through the roof. And I was asking, like, what's going on? Because there hadn't been changes to reimbursement. They're like, we figure it out. We get people when they come in on the ambulance. We put reimbursement in the ER so we get them on the gurney. And so, and you hear those types of stories, you're like, your, your profits are going up because you're better able to collect while they're on the gurney in the ER. Like, that's not the healthcare system that I actually want. And so I become super passionate about this, and I've always been super passionate about healthcare. And so um, when I've done some of these different speeches, someone was asking, well, why are you so passionate? And I realized a lot of this actually came from my mother. So we think about our teachers, and why is my mother, my mother is a very unusual, she's a teacher at Pali High School, she's a very um, active individual, you, um, she's, she states her mind, for those of you who know her, she states her mind, um, <laughs> you don't want to wrong her. <laughs> I knew a lot about lawsuits as a child because, because she loves suing people. Um, <laughs> um, but, but what happened with my mother is my mother had a little brother named David, and when my mom was about five or six years old, David ate a bottle of aspirin, and he was 18 months old. Uh, they took him to three different hospitals, and at each hospital they were turned away, either because they couldn't show proof of payment or because they said that um, um, David would be fine, they would pump his stomach, they said he was fine. The last hospital they finally took him in, he was screaming, and my grandmother called in the morning to see how is David, and they said, your son is in the mortuary. Um, and so my mom remembers this incredibly well, that they knew there was something wrong with David, and all these doctors were sending them away, and my grandmother was too passive and too accepting and too willing to listen to these other people telling her what was actually going on with her son. And my mom remembers at that moment in time, no one would ever walk on her and that she was responsible for her health. And if she didn't take care of herself, no one else would. And I think that that is something I have learned over and over. The more I've understood healthcare from the investment world, the more I've understood it from my own experiences, is that you have to be an advocate. You actually have to be in charge. And there's so many disincentives right now for us to actually take ownership of our health data. And so, I mean, you think about how many of you, you all probably bank online. You could go online right now and get your bank information. But how many of you could go online right now and actually get your medical records? or your drug history, and technically what's more important, your money or, or your medical information your met, and your health. 
And so there's all kinds of disincentives in place to prevent you from actually owning your own health information. And one of the studies I love to cite is that in 1961, there was a big study that was done of physicians, and they asked physicians, how many of you would tell your patients if they had cancer? So which is sort of a crazy question today. But in 1961, 90% of physicians did not want to tell their patients they had cancer. So, so in large part, we've come a long ways but there's a lot more to go. And I think we reference sort of the, the 23andMe and our FDA issues. 23andMe is about consumer empowerment and about giving you access to what I believe is, a, is the next generation of, of healthcare and of health information. And so that empowerment creates some controversy. And I think that's where we've bumped up against in with the FDA and sort of starting to understand that it is a regulated system. And so one of, the things that, um, one of the things that I start to think about a lot now in this valley, and especially with the next generation, is that healthcare is not easy. You know, my, my former husband, Sergey, he had a great quote with, um, with Vinod Kosla, where he said, he's, he started to miss it, oh, healthcare is, you know, it's, it's regulated, I don't want to go into it. And, and in part, it's such a disservice, that's a problem. All of us have to absorb and use healthcare and the healthcare system, but all these luminaries, there's so few people in the tech world who actually want to get involved and solve those hard problems. And so one of the things when I think about is that how is it that we can actually inspire that next generation to actually start solving some of these healthcare problems. If you think about healthcare and the rest of the entire world, we're so far behind. Healthcare just doesn't do some of the basics. Like again, the fact that you have to walk in, I just went to the doctor recently, you have to walk in and write your name and your symptoms every single time over and over and over again. I mean, does anyone even look at that? No. <laughs> so so you, it's just there's so many arcane ways and how is it that we can change the system? And I think one of the problems is we're not really gonna change the entire system without really more of a revolt. And one of the groups that really inspired me was the HIV community. And again, this is, I'm fortunate this is a crowd that's probably old enough to remember the HIV movement and what was happening back in the 90s. But there was the pink triangles and the angry, you know, throwing blood, the fake blood on Glaxo, and they stormed the FDA. And they came in and they said, like, we're a group of people. Like, if I'm going to die, lay my body on top of the FDA. They were angry. They weren't just about doing a walk and donating money and doing other things, but they wanted to do something. And it's part of what I try to inspire now with 23andMe is that you can actually do something today with your data. Is that the, the best asset you have today is taking ownership of it and then contributing your data to this greater good of research. So there's a ton going on right now with Apple and the research kit, which is spectacular. And then 23andMe has a movement for research. 80% of our million customers participate in research. And so with all of that research, we're hoping to actually do the discoveries and the research that are interesting to the consumers and that will also then advance drug discovery and basic health understanding. So we make findings on things that are not medically relevant but are really exciting, things like cilantro. So some people hate cilantro and they think it tastes like soap and some people love it. And it's, it's wildly controversial on, on the 23andMe community. Um, but then we do things like Parkinson's research, and we recently just hired the former head of R&D from Genentech, Richard Scheller, who's now joined, and we're mining this data to see, can we actually make drug discovery better? Can we make really meaningful discoveries? And so for people, when they have a disease, when they have cancer, they have something else that's incurable, or they don't have a great way of treating it, just sitting at home and doing a walk or donating money is not a very meaningful experience. But if you can actually contribute with your data in some capacity, and either through Research Kit and the different types of programs they're doing, or with 23andMe and some of the things that we're doing, you can then do something. And that movement of doing something, and that's again what I learned with the HIV community, just do something with your data. Take the ownership, ask for it, demand the information, ask for your medical records, ask for your, your drug history, and take that ownership. So I've been super lucky to be, um, to be part of the Silicon Valley community um, I used to whine 
a lot about healthcare when I was investing and I would complain and oh, it's so corrupt and it's this and it's that. And it was actually Larry Page one day just got annoyed and he's like, you're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution and you're pretty annoying right now. Um, and so <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> Carl in the back knows how, how friendly Larry can be sometimes. Um, so, and it was one of the things that inspired me that it, I think this valley does so well that when you see a problem, you know, don't be afraid of just trying to tackle it and challenge it. And, and in part, when I think about us with our FDA issues, when I meet people in other parts of the country, so many people talk about that, like, oh, like, that's horrible. You must have, you know, like, it must have been a horrible event for you. And like, it, it wasn't great, but in some ways it was also inspiring that we got that much attention, that we were changing things so much that we actually got that level of, of, of attention. And the Valley was so supportive of us and our recruiting, the fact that we were able to recruit so incredibly well after our letter shows that there's people who actually really want to make that change. And so I feel super fortunate to have grown up in an area where one, I really learned to be passionate and I learned to follow my passions. And that too, this idea of like changing, doing something that's better for the world and not just like standing around and being passive about it, but doing something that's better. And the, my last takeaway from it, from everything that I've learned now, um, the Valley definitely, you watch Silicon Valley, the TV show, which I haven't watched that much of, um, but, and everyone has it, oh, I'm gonna, you know, like, I wanna, I, want, I wanna make change right now, I'm impatient, I'm, you know, like, everyone goes in their VC and they're like, I wanna see the change right away. Like, it's like, it's like if you don't say that, you're not part of the Valley. And, and the one thing I've learned is that doesn't work in DC. Um, when you walk in, <laughs> when, when, when you walk in and you're like, I'm so impatient, I want to see change right away, um, <laughs> that doesn't go. It gets you in trouble. <laughs> so um, so I've, come to, I've come to have this appreciation. And there was someone at Genentech who said to me, and they said, Ann, if you just want to sell 23andMe, this should be your strategy and this is how you, you know, in two years you could do X, Y, and Z and you circumvent the whole system. But if you really want to go for change, then you have to partner with the system. And as painful it is that, you know, your genetic information is regulated, but cigarettes and guns, you know, are much more easily accessible, like, it's just the reality. And, and part of what I've embraced is like, that is the reality. We can work with the system and let's help educate, let's bring it around. And it is going to be a multi-year process to do this, it's not gonna change instantly. But for the first time, I'm really embracing this level of patience. And it is antithetical, I think, a little bit to the Valley, and it's something I think that's unique with healthcare, but that patience, I think, will eventually pay, uh, pay off. So um, I do hope that this group of individuals that are so inspiring and have done so much are gonna start thinking about healthcare. And especially as we all age and we have to go through the system, thinking about how is it that you can actually make a difference. And I would love to challenge everyone in this room to go home and one, take ownership of your data, ask for your medical records, ask for your drug history, ask for your lab values. I failed at getting my lab core data because I don't have a fax machine and I couldn't do all those things. Um, but, but ask for all that information and see what you can actually, then, and understand that importance and understand what it is and then think about what is it that this next generation of Silicon Valley can do to actually really change healthcare. So thank you so much again for this award. It's a great honor and uh, thank you for having me.